Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. We are so excited that you have chosen to worship with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and you can watch our live services on YouTube. For more information about the church and how you can get connected, you can visit our website, ehconline.org. Now join us as Bishop Collins delivers a powerful, timely message. Father, bless this word, and Lord, take it beyond the limits of my humanity. Let it, God, go into our spirits, and especially the men and the fathers under the sound of my voice. Lord, in this short, brief moment of word, you can do great things that extend through time and eternity. Anoint us with ears that hear, eyes that see, hearts and a desire to draw nearer, my God, to thee. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to just talk to you for a few moments about the reality that there are some misconceptions that are floating in the atmosphere. Misconceptions that really are about fathers and men in general. The first misconception is that men don't have the capacity for real emotions. We don't have the capacity for compassion and empathy and the belief is that men as a whole, we really just don't care. And then if we are moved by our emotions, if you shed a tear, then we are looked at as though we are soft or there is something wrong with us. The second misconception that comes mainly from our society is that men in general and fathers in specific are expendable and not necessary to a healthy society. That is why we are living in a time where it is easy to downplay the fact that a family needs two parents in, this ho in the home. That's why we are living in a time where people have the mindset that it does not matter. As long as there is a male and a female in that house, it does not matter if the father does his duties. But even beyond that, there is a mindset that says if there is a male and a female parenting together, it does not matter. What really matters is that there are two parents in that room, but it doesn't matter about what sex they are. We are living in a time where it says that it all all that matters is that it's okay that little Johnny or little Marie, that they have two fathers or two mothers, that doesn't matter. Because after all, men in general and fathers in specific are not necessary any longer for a healthy society and a family. There is a mindset flowing out there that as long as there is love, that is all that matters. But I want to suggest today that love is necessary and good, but love by itself is not enough. Would we understand today that if it were so, there would not be so many people who love each other getting divorced today? Because there are some things, listen to me church, we have taught you in the church that as long as you love one another, everything's going to be all right. Let me tell you something, there are some things that love by itself cannot provide to a marriage or to a family. Love is the impetus, the driving force for all that we do, but love alone is not enough. There must be some action accompanying our passion. And in God's word, he tells us all of the things that we need to do along with love if we are going to have a healthy marriage relationship. And so it is when it comes to the family. And when we try to create our own description of what constitutes a family, it will take time. But believe me when I tell you this. The nations that do that, that go away from God's prescription for the family, we will eventually pay the price for upsetting God's divine order. Watch this now. There are some things that a woman cannot teach a son and vice versa. There are some things that the father brings to the home that the mother cannot bring and vice versa. And while that is not the message of this hour, even those who don't believe or necessarily follow God, they are showing us that where there is no father, there is a danger. Listen to this. There is an article that is entitled, Why Children Need Nurturing Fathers. Watch what I'm about to say. There was a survey of more than 1,600 teenagers that was done by Harvard. 
and it found that almost twice as many, 14, many 14 to 18 year old boys and girls feel comfortable opening up to their mothers, that's 72 percent, as to their fathers, 39 percent, about anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges. The gap suggests that fathers can and need to become more involved at the home, offering the kind of emotional support that many children urgently need. It goes on to say that intimacy between a parent and a child acts as a protective buffer against the day-to-day -day challenges of life. In a 2021 study published in the Journal of Family Psychology, researchers found that closeness with fathers was associated with few weight concerns, higher self-esteem, and fewer depression symptoms for both boys and girls. A paper published in January 2023 highlighted the roles that dads play in building child skills in regulating emotions. It found that fathers who were involved in caregiving and play and who reacted with warmth and great sensitivity to a child who expressed emotions were significantly more likely to have children with better emotional balance from infancy to adolescence. Listen to what else it says. Those skills in children are linked in turn with higher levels of social competence, academic achievement, and resilience. Conversely, poor regulation skills are linked with anxiety, depression, and behavioral problems. Boys can especially be affected by whether fathers are part of the emotional equation because many men didn't grow up with an emotionally healthy male role model. Many young men today lack the confidence in their own abilities to be sensitive caregivers which can hold them back. Listen to the end result of this article. The bottom line is that a strong fatherly connection helps young people manage their emotions and deal with mental health crises. Listen to me very closely, especially men. The survey that I just shared with you, it was not done by a seminary. It was not done by a Bible college. It was done by Harvard University. Are you hearing me? It has no ties to a bunch of Christians trying to put people on guilt trips, but even the secular world is beginning to understand that we have great mental issues with our young people, and it is directly tied to the reality that fathers are not connected to their children. It blows my mind that we as a society still do not make the connection between the ch parent-child connection, especially the absence of fathers. UCLAHealth.org reported in an article that was updated February 23, 2023, that suicide is the leading cause of death among people aged 15 to 25 in the United States. Nearly 20% of high school students report serious thoughts of suicide, and 9% have made an attempt to take their lives according to the National Alliance of Mental Health. I came across another article in k12dive.com, and it asked the question, will school shootings in 2023 outpace last year's record high? It goes on to say, if trends from the past five decades for the remain, continue for the remainder of the year, there would be about 400 shootings in 2023, outpacing last year's record high of 273. There have already been more shootings in our schools with more victims so far in the first three months of 2023 than during the same time frame last year. And in the realm of the church, if we are semi-spiritual, would it be that we would understand that there is a devil that is running amok? But I think there is something that we blame on the devil that we need to stop blaming on the devil. And we need to have a reality check that we men and we fathers, many of us, have checked out. And it is a great contributor to the suicide rate. The fatherly involvement in the church has all but disappeared and in the lives of their children. Look around you. Many fathers are not here today because, as I said earlier, they think Father's Day is more important to go out to breakfast or to lunch or to brunch or to dinner. Watch this. Last year in October of 2022, I purchased a copy of Life magazine. It was a tribute to and a special edition to Lucille Ball, whose father died four years after she was born. She rose above that trial and many others to reach her dream and her vision of acting. But shortly before her death, she had a remarkable TV interview with Merv Griffin. And he asked her a very serious and pointed question. 
Lucille, you've lived a long time on this earth, and you are a wise person. What's happened to this country? What's wrong with our children? Why are our families falling apart? What's missing? Lucille Ball answered without hesitation, Papa's missing. Things are falling apart because Papa's gone. If Papa were here, he would fix it. She died on April 26, 1989 at the age of 77, but her words ring more true 34 years later than the day that she said those words. And we are deaf, and we cannot see if we don't understand the validity of those words more today than ever before. I believe she nailed it. We have a nation where there is a great void of families being led by fathers in this nation under the banner of God's order for the family. And even in some homes, fathers are in the home, but they are not providing the spiritual leadership to the family. And we have a government that is doing everything that it can to destroy the biblical historical structure of what constitutes a family. We have a culture that is successfully downplaying the need for our homes where there are men who act like men and women who act like women. And listen to me, church. Many of the churches in America today, we are aiding the cultural assault on the family. And I want to say it again today that we need to remember that we do not get our marching orders from the culture. We get our marching orders from the word of God and that alone. And that is the mandate that if we're going to have families, we need to have healthy men and healthy women living together in harmony. Amen. I don't think that we understand the seriousness of what's going on in our country. There is a scripture that cries this very hour for revelation from heaven to earth. In the Old Testament, the last book in the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. It is the last book of the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is the prophetic voice of New Testament, and the New Testament is a fulfillment of all that was prophesied in the Old Testament. I want you to take careful note of something, that after God spoke in Malachi, he didn't say another thing to the nation of Israel or to the world for 400 years. He remained totally silent. There was no voice of God in the earth. And I read that and I said, God, why did you go silent for 400 years? And I believe that it was because of what he said at the end of Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. I believe that he wanted us to think about the prophetic word that he uttered in those two verses. Listen to what God said there. He said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now take note of that. The prophet in this case is not the Elijah of the Old Testament. It is projecting us toward the Elijah of the New Testament. This Elijah is Jesus. And it says, Behold, I will send you Elisha the prophet, Jesus, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he is going to do something the original Elijah and the second Elijah, who was John the Baptist, did not do. He, Jesus, the runner, the, the Elijah, shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and I smite the earth with a curse. Church, look at me. We are living in a time right now where Elisha is trying to turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers and the hearts of the fathers back to their children. And I believe that we are living in an hour where God is seeking and is raising up men and making fathers that he can say of them as he said of King David in 1 Samuel 13 and 14, He's saying today, I have found some men that have hearts after my own heart. You see, we were down in Orlando, and the initial reason for us going was to go for a men's conference. And we went there, and we were with Dr. Watkins in our men's conference. It was based upon this fact that God is trying to raise up priests and kings in this day and age. I believe that God is seeking to take men from the place of merely existing as mere males to matriculating to the place of manhood. 
Let me tell you what God says about you men. He says it about women, but today I need men to hear me. And I need young men. Listen to me. The Bible says teenagers, young men, don't let anybody look down on your youth but mature. Listen to what it says about us men in Revelation 1 and 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Church, I can see it all over America. There is evidence that there is a clarion call being heard from heaven. That it is time for kingdom men to rise up and to live as kings and priests unto our God. For it is only when a male begins to understand that he has been created to operate as a king that is with authority as a protector and a provider. And as a priest, as the spiritual provisionary, that a male goes from merely existing, that a male stops floundering in the state of malehood and begins to be what he's designed to be, a king and a priest unto God. And we're going to talk about that next Sunday and the next Sunday and the next Sunday as necessary. Because we need to understand, men, what it means to operate in this earth as a king and a priest. Our families are depending on it. The story is told of a father with five children who came home with a toy. He summoned his children and he asked which of them should be given the presents. He said, children, who is the most obedient one here? And who never talks back to mom and does everything mom says to do? He looked at them and all of a sudden together they said, Daddy, you should play with the toy. I said that to say this. There are some men, they play with life like it's a toy. Let me say it again. Our earth is dangerously overrun with males. And terribly void of men. Let me just be straight. We are living in a time where too many males are masquerading as men and are downright childish. In the next few weeks, I'm going to give the difference between the symptoms of a male who operates in childish behavior and contrast that with the methods of those who are truly men. But as I prepare to close today, Paul says something about the reality that at some point, all males, they will become men if they will learn that there comes a time in all of our lives where there needs to be a matriculation from childish behavior to adult behavior. Now, there is a word that has been developed by the millennial generation and adopted by all generations. It is the word called adulting. What is that? Adulting gets on my nerve. I saw a lady who had to be in her 50s wearing a shirt, I am adulting. I said to myself, lady, you too late to adult if you haven't grown up yet. Listen now. Because what we need to understand, when we grew up and we talked about being an adult, it meant something. You know what being an adult means today to most of our generation? You know what adulting means to them? It means that I might grow up, I might not grow up, or I might grow up a little. And if I do grow up a little, I reserve the right to regress. But no matter what, even if I live to be 90, I will be growing up. Paul says, Men, no, you don't have time to be growing up. It is time to grow up. 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, here it is. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of a child, and I put them behind me. Listen to me, church. We live life in three cycles. The first cycle, we become a baby. We come out of our mother's wombs, and we depend upon our mothers for everything. Then we go into the second cycle. We become children. We depend upon our mother for not everything but many things. And Paul says when you're in the second cycle, he says, I was there. And in that second cycle, he says, I want you to understand that there were things that I did. There was the way that 
that I thought, the way that I talked, the way that I reasoned, the way that I made decisions. He said, but then I grew up. And he said, but some of us grew up and nothing changed. We still talk the same way. We reason the same way. We make decisions the same way. But then he said, when I became a man, 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 I put away childish things. I stopped talking like a child. I stopped thinking like a child. I stopped making decisions like a child. When I became a man, I started behaving like a grown man should behave. Let me just talk to us, man. He said, when I became a man, let me tell you something. You don't become a man because you hit the magic number. When I was growing up, the magic number was 21, and I know for sure that was a lie. Then they changed it a few years back, and the magic number became that men mature emotionally around the age of 25 and women 21. Okay, everybody listen. Guess what the new number is? It is now being said that men don't mature emotionally until age 43 and women 32. I said, I am scared. <laughs> yes, I am. Mm, is anybody else scared? <laughs> Let me just say something. Here's the freaky part. Those are the people who are going to be running our nation. If you ain't scared, you need to get scared. Listen to me now. I want my men to hear this. We in this kingdom, we are not governed by what the governed, the culture says. We are not governed by statistics. We are governed by what thus saith the Lord that we can be, that we can do, and that we are. It is far too late for us to be trying to grow up. Tell the person next to you. Too late, grow up. Let me tell you something. I'm as serious as two heart attacks. I got a pacemaker in my chest. And I'm as serious as this pacemaker. Please understand something. The need for kings and priests is more desperate than ever before. Hear me, men. You need to prosper. Yes, you do. You need to prosper. There is nothing wrong with a nice house, a nice car, some nice clothes. There is nothing wrong with you starting a business, and I pray that you prosper in every way. There is nothing wrong with financial prosperity because the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for their children and their children's children. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. When Lady Brenda and I went into the ministry, in fact, for almost 20 some years of ministry, forget about leaving an inheritance. I just like to find some money to start one with. But let me tell you something that is very important for you to understand. I looked at my father who was 91 years old and I began to realize there is no inheritance for him to leave for his six children. But he gave me an inheritance that far outweighs money. Watch what I'm about to say. Let me show you the inheritance that's most important, men. This is an account told by Gail Irwin concerning his personal testimony. Listen to what he says. When I was six years old, my father was severely injured in an airplane accident and was left paralyzed and brain damaged. My mother then became the breadwinner of the house. Since my mother was often not there, as she attempted to make a living and my dad was not there physically or mentally, the stage was set for family failure. But our family did not fail. Through difficult times, both parents stayed faithful to God and to us. Prayer, belief, steadfastness, and love surrounded us. Money and fine homes didn't. When my father died, my two brothers and I stood in front of his casket and made the following statement to the friends who gathered at the funeral service. Listen now. Our father did not leave a financial empire for us to carry on. Many things that dad, a dad normally does with his sons, ours was unable to do. He was unable to teach us many things that a dad normally teaches, but he did leave us something that he had. He left us a love of God, a love for the Bible, a love for people, an understanding of worship and an ability, inability to hate people. We feel that he has left us only things that will last. So we stand here before you as his sons and declare publicly that we will follow God. 
you ought to clap your hands. Listen to me, church. That's the kind of legacy that I want to leave for our daughters. You see, men of the kingdom understand you're going to leave a legacy no matter what. The question is, what kind of legacy are you going to leave? What does money mean if your children believe what the world says about them above what God says about them? What is the value of a big, fancy house if it's not a home and it's filled with anger and division? What value is there to an extravagant vacation if your children despise God and hate church? Last week, we stayed in a hotel and our daughters, and we were laughing because we said to one another, if you had told us even 10, 15 years ago that we'd be able to stay in a hotel this fancy, we would have laughed at you. But let me tell you what we said after that. We don't have any more joy in this expensive hotel than we did when we had to stay in Motel 6 where they leave the light on for you. Because what good is the ability to stay wherever you want to stay and take extravagant vacations when your children hate church and hate God? My greatest joy in this room today is to be able to look at our daughters and know that they're not in church because they have to be because they're grown women, but they're in this house because they love God and they love the kingdom of God. And here's what I want you to hear, men. They love God in spite of their imperfect father because God has not called us to be perfect. He's called us to have perfect hearts. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? He said, what does it gain you if you lose your way spiritually? And if you lose your way spiritually, you risk losing your family. You risk losing your finances. You risk losing everything. I got up this morning and I sat back in my chair and I said, God, I thank you. I thank you. Because I remember when we would take our Sears credit card just to buy formula to feed our children. Because God is faithful. There's a pastor by the name of Jerry Elstein as we prepare to shift directions. When he first became the pastor of his church, he had to have a supplemental income, a side job in which he did by mixing feed. And for a period of about two weeks, every day he would come home from work. And his two boys, ages two and three, would look at him and they would smile and they would say, boy, daddy, you sure are dusty. And he would reply, yes, I sure am dusty. And then he would go in and get himself cleaned up. He didn't think much of it until one day he was washing his car. And while he was washing his car, he saw his oldest son picking up gravel and stones in the driveway and rubbing them on his pants. And Jerry asked him, what are you doing? And he replied, I want to be dusty like you, Dad. And Jerry said, I realize that if a child would look up to his father for being dusty and want to copy his father, a child could look up to his father and follow him for anything. I want to challenge you men as I prepare to go in another direction. There's a scripture we should make our aim and our goal. We should do it whether we have sons, because if we do this, then our sons will have a pattern to follow that will make them the kind of men that God desires them to be. 
And we should do this if we have daughters. Because if we do it well, very possibly, it will determine the kind of man our daughters marry. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. My question this hour to my men, are you truly following Christ or simply portraying the acts of religion? Now we're going to change directions. This is a special Sunday for me and for many of the men in our congregation. Last summer, I said to my wife, honey, there's something God is stirring in my spirit. And I feel like he wants me to do something above and beyond what we do with men's ministry. And it did not replace what Pastor Lopez is doing with the men's ministry. It even has come to serve and help to build that ministry. But God said to me, I want you to start investing in men in this congregation. And he gave me this vision to establish what we call the breakfast with Bishop. And then he said, I want you to start a mentoring program and I want you to title it Redefining Manhood. This thing has developed into a nine-month course that is held once a month, every second Saturday of the month, and men don't simply just come and get a teaching. We meet together and we grow together, and then they graduate from this program. And this first group, I told them, I said, guys, you guys are kind of like my spiritual guinea pigs. We're going to build this thing off of you. And they had to come every month, and for seven months, they crammed in nine months worth of study. And they were only allowed to miss twice during that time. And if they missed, they had to listen to the CD of that lesson. Otherwise, they could not graduate, which is what many of them are going to do today. And this course was designed to take all of us, including this preacher, from the place of understanding that there is a difference between being a male and being a man. And it was interesting to me, look at me, and I want you to understand something, that I was the instructor, I was the author, and God began to show me areas of my life where I was operating as a male and not as a man. And so God began to teach us how to live and elevate ourselves in those areas of life in the kingdom. And this course equipped not just grown men, not just married men, But you're going to see youth that will come before you today who completed this course and they finished. And there was something that one of our young men said. There were 27 guys who came into the course, and I'm here today to tell tell you that all 27 of them successfully made it through the course. So proud of them. And there was a statement that one of our young men made that stayed with me. And it stayed with me because other young men pretty much began to emulate and make the same statement in different ways. And before I tell you what he said, I am encouraging every man in this congregation, when we do it again in the fall, when the invitation goes out, you need to sign up, you need to register, you need to be there because I will promise you and these men will tell you that we will never, you will never be the same if you finish this course. And one young man said this to me. His father has not been in his life. And I'm paraphrasing what he said. He said, I decided that it was time for me to stop using my father as an excuse. It's my time to break the generational curse. And men, listen to me. Most of the time, generational curses are simply the family tradition of sin. Now watch. He used the impetus of a bad past to be the launching board to a great future. And I've been blessed to stand in this pulpit on Sunday mornings like I'm doing right now. And when I look across this congregation and I see the men who have been in that course, they give me the words of Jesus in reality that the eyes are the window to the soul. They don't look the same. 
Their eyes are different. God has changed them. He has made their hearts and their lives begin to radiate. I have been so blessed to see men who would stand in this congregation and they were very staunch and they were not going to show emotion. And as they worship God, tears begin to flow in their eyes because they are so thankful to God and his goodness and the things that have changed in their lives. I have been blessed to see men who have taken and are dating young ladies and say, I'm going to get it right this time. I'm not going to mess this up. I'm going to bring glory and honor to God by honoring the woman that he has placed in my life. I'm not going to treat her just anyway. I have been blessed to see that these are the ones who took Maya Angelou's words to heart to do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. I have been blessed, so blessed, that there are youth that are graduating from this program today. Teenagers, young men whose fathers are not in their lives, who have said, I'm not going to wait to become a man. I'm going to begin the journey now. And to have young men come and sit with me and say, Bishop, how do I deal with this? What do I do? Because my father's not in my life, though I wish he was. And today I see those young men graduate from our program today. Lady Brenda, would you come? She's going to call their names. And as they come, they're going to come and spread across the front of this altar. I'm going to have the honor of handing them their diplomas. And then I'm going to come back up here and just say a little word of encouragement. Would you come, Lady Brenda? Our first man is David Altidore. God bless you. Proud of you. Gabriel Asunyokembi. There he is. <laughs> As in the first service, I'm standing up here so I can see you eye to eye. <laughs> John Berryweso. And as in the first service, I'm stepping down because we can see each other eye to eye. Brian Cardona. Going up two steps, Brian. <laughs> God bless you. Zion Delusion. Is one of our young people. A young man who's going to make a difference. Come on, somebody. Now, I just want you to know that when this young man came to this church, I could have stood down there. But now I'm going to stay up here because you, you, you're growing fast, son. Zeldison Depina. One more, Z. <laughs> Fareed DeSources. Bless you, Fareed. Tell you again, proud of you, but I really like that tie. I'm glad you got some taste. James Adibri. All right, James. Bless you, Deacon. Richard Felton. Bless you, Richard. Bless you. Man, the smile on your face is amazing. 
Felix Carlos Figueroa. Felix Robert Figueroa. Marcos Goncalves. <laughs> Deacon Marcos, bless you. Chris Jean. Leighton Johnyard. Bless you, Leighton. Raj Lewis Stanley. Another one of our young men. We had to snatch him out of youth group. <laughs> Bless you, Raj. Okay, I got one thing to ask Lady Brenda before you go forward. Uh, Raj, Zion, are you, would you guys like to donate some hair? I'd like some. You know, do what you can, okay? <laughs> Pastor Cecilio Lopez. Faithful man of God. Pastor Michelle Medichal. Pastor Michelle, run, run. <laughs> Mr. Energy himself. <laughs> Louis McCaskill II. All right, another one of our young adults just graduated from high school. Proud of your son. Come on over here. Now, you know I got to stay up here because when you were a baby, I came to see you. And who would have thought you'd grow up to be the man you are? Ramon Mejia. Ah. Bless you, son. Zeniba W. Matiku. Z2. <laughs> okay, now, I just want to tell you, he won the gift in the first service. If he does not wear it, just remember, he's saying Bishop has bad taste. <laughs> Chandler Mompoint. Clifford Philippe. Cliff, do you remember how long you've been here now? <laughs> Since 2005, thank you for your faithfulness. Schaefer Pierre. All right, two steps. <laughs> Schaefer, God bless you. Siddhar Raymond. <laughs> Deacon Siddhar. <laughs> I just want you to know we have lights because of Deacon Siddhar. <laughs> Clifton Verdu. <laughs> Where's Deacon Cliff? He's in kids' church, oh. serving. Okay, we'll let him have it next They're service. going to go get him. Oh, they're going to go get him? Okay. While they're on the march, I'm going to say much more to you guys, but I want to say again how proud I am of all of you. It's rare that a pastor can stand in a church and look around and see all these men. Did you hear what I just said? It's rare. You guys are changing generations. And here's the great part about you. I know and look at every last one of you. And for you, you're serious about not yourselves, but what you do for God. And that's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference. As they're going for Deacon Cliff, I want you all to turn and I want to, you to face me because I want to share with you a message that is very short but I think is important. 
after one of these services, you're going to get to take these bags home. <laughs> In them, you're going to find three gifts. The first one is the book, The Five Masculine Instincts by Chase Replogli, A Guide to Becoming a Better Man. You guys have made the transition, and you've made it well from male to manhood. That's going to aid you in becoming more and more the man God has designed you to be. The second one is a book by J. Lee Grady, Ten Lies Men Believe. The devil has been lying to us, and society has lied to us about the value of a man. This book will help you dispel some of the lies that we've been told that hinder us. And then secondly, you're going to find a pair of cufflinks in there with the letter M. Now, someone tried to guess what that was, and he confessed to me, I thought Michigan. Good guess, but let me tell you what it is. Some of you are going to have to go out and buy a shirt so you can put the cuffs in it, French cuff shirt, because the M has a purpose. It is to remind you that you have made a successful transition from male to manhood. And I want to remind all of us that we're on a continual journey to achieve manhood over malehood. From time to time, you will slip back into your malehood and just remind yourself that it's not a destination, it's a journey. Next week, you'll hear me talk about how my malehood showed up driving on the highways of Florida. <laughs> Today, I know I want to remind you that very few men understand the difference between being male and the fact that being a male does not make you a man. Very quickly, I remind you of some of the lessons we learned. We learned that men are accountable. Men are willing to take responsibility. Men don't simply lead, they provide leadership. Men are intentional about living righteous and holy lives. Men intentionally hold themselves at a higher standard than everybody else around them. You have done well. You have done as the Apostle Paul. You have run well. You have fought the good fight of faith. You have finished this course, this course. But I want to remind you of the purpose of why ultimately you have done this. It is because of Ezekiel 22, verse 30. God said, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. The devil is banking that men like you would never rise up. But today, he has had to swallow his desire because God has found some men who I am confident are going to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. Listen to me, men. Our nation, like never before, needs men who will stand in the gap. And God knows that the Bible even shows us that God has used women in many ways. But whenever God desires to save a nation, he always raises up a man. Come on, somebody. And today, at the last moment, he said for me to tell you that he's found his men. And he says this about you. Took my mind to Isaiah 58, 12. And you shall be of those that shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in. Next Sunday, I'm going to really explain that scripture. But let me say this. Many will dwell in safety because of you. What you have done these last few months. Many, many, many. Church, would you stretch your hands toward them? I'm going to pray for these men before they return to their seats. Father, I thank you for the awesome privilege I have had 
to invest a tiny bit into the kingdom men that you have assigned to this great congregation. Lord, I thank you that they are helping to redefine manhood. That, Father, they are taking back what the devil has stolen. And your word says that if a thief be found out, he must restore sevenfold that that he has stolen. And so I thank you that sevenfold blessing is coming over their lives in spirit, soul, and body. And Lord, in this kingdom, we will be blessed because they have made the decision that they refuse to flounder in the land of malehood, but to rise up to manhood and become kings and priests unto our God. Bless them and keep them in all their ways. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you put your hands together as they return to their seats? God bless you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been amazing to worship with you once again. I want to remind you that to stay up to date on our upcoming events and activities, you can visit us at ehconline.org, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday.